morning. Great to see you. All right, I'm going to put up a screen image here, and I want you to raise your hand if you watched this game right here between these two teams. Boom. Who's that? Anybody? Anybody remember watching that about three or four years ago? No? Yeah, yeah. No, oh, 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 I know Corey watched it. This is the Patriots and the Falcons. Today we're going to talk about halftime because at halftime in Super Bowl 51, this looked like the absolute most lopsided, lamest game in Super Bowl history. Advertisers were pulling their hair out at halftime because people were turning off, as obvious by how few people watched it, myself included, in this room. It was one of those games. I think at halftime, the Falcons were up 28-3 against Tom Brady and the New England Patriots. I mean Patriots. During, dur- uh, sorry, I like the, uh, okay, okay, you applaud that? Really? All right. At halftime, the Vegas betting odds and several statisticians were having the Falcons, wait for it, at 99.5% certain of victory. Nine, y'all, that's a sure bet. I'm not a betting man, but if I were, I would take those odds. At halftime, something happened. At halftime, this game, what happened next will live in infamy. Something in that locker room was whispered. Some strategy changed. Something happened that was so drastically different that when they came out, the Atlanta Falcons would never score another point. Some say it's the greatest collapse in history. Others call it the greatest comeback in history. Going into the final quarter, the Falcons were still heavy favorites, up 38, up 28 to, to 9 at this point. Vegas still had them heavily favored to win this game. But Tom Brady had other plans. This is where he proved his GOAT credentials. If you're not sure about the GOAT, greatest of all time, you're welcome. Just wanted to clear that up. He had four scoring drives in the fourth quarter alone. As the clock ran out, it was 28 to 28. And the game ended in a tie. No, they went in overtime. Flip the coin. The Patriots get the ball first. Tom Brady goes down, doesn't kick a field goal, scores a touchdown, game's over, the rest is history. Think about what just happened. They flipped a 28-3 deficit to win 34-28 in overtime. They trailed 28-3. Think about this. Five of their final six drives, they scored. What happened? Why? What happened when, when defeat was certain? How was it that they were able to change course? And that's what we're talking about today. It's not too late to finish strong. It was only halftime. Somebody forgot to tell the Falcons that. Here's the good news. We're halfway through the year. If your first half of 2021 has not been what you'd hoped it'd be, it's not too late for a fresh start. If the first half of 2021 is something you'd rather not think about, something you would absolutely rather not even reminisce over, you are in good company. Congratulations, you have made If you are hearing my voice today, if you're online listening to us, give yourself a pat on the back. You're still standing. It would have been so easy to cash it in. It would have been so easy to say, well, this is just another year like last year. We're not going to do it. You still have time. The midsummer is the perfect time to regroup. You know, we love New Year's, right? We always look at these halftime adjustments and stuff, but New Year's, we, we instinctively do this. Everything's new. Everything's fresh. We have all these resolutions. But how many people keep the New Year's resolutions? Forbes magazine says 8%. 8% of people will keep those New Year's resolutions. So today, if you haven't had a whole lot of time to look back, I want us to have a halftime checkup to embrace some new healthy habits, some new changes. And if you don't have a whole lot of good to talk about for the first year, you have time to make a halftime adjustment, all right? It makes all the difference. So I'm going to ask you just a couple questions just to kind of get us thinking today. And I want you to look back over the first six months of this year, and I want you to ask yourself, what was the biggest win for these first six months? I'm going to just take a minute, think about it. What was your victory? Did you have anything? What, what is something you are pleased about? It could be you made progress eating healthier. Could, some of you laughed, okay? It, it made progress uh, losing five pounds. Might be establishing some healthy habits with recreation. It might be um, you got a scholarship. Some of our youth, we got scholarships for, for college. It may be a job promotion. Maybe you were praying for that neighbor 
and they came with you to church and they accepted Christ. Or maybe you had a family member who was baptized. Maybe there was some spiritual breakthrough or some spiritual victory with, with your children or, or your parents. What is it? Can you look back? What was your biggest win? What would you say if you had to write it down on a card? Maybe it was just coming out of your cave. Maybe it was just coming out of hibernation. Your biggest win was simply reemerging into society. That counts. There's no shame there. All right, second question. In what area did you suffer? What area did you lose momentum? Looking back on these first six months, if you could change something to generate momentum in that area, what area is that? Can you identify it? Most of us know right away. All right? What is a healthy habit that you can begin for the second half of the year? What is one healthy habit you know you need to implement in order to improve? It could be physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, friendship-related, church-wise. What is the one thing that you would be pleased if it happened in the second half and you could call it a victory, something to hang your hat on? What is it? What's the one thing you're praying for? As you look forward, do you have any goals? See, the good news is, like that halftime game, your year's not over. Somebody needs to hear this. Don't give up. You're only halfway through the year. The, it's so easy for us to just give up. It's so easy for us to make excuses for why we're not taking ground in our personal lives. It's so easy for us to make excuses why we're not taking ground in our spiritual lives, why we're not working out, why we're not eating better, why we're not spending more time with our families, why we're not faithfully and consistently gathering on the Sabbath, why we're not spending more time in the Word. Excuses, excuses. Some of them are valid, right? We have them. There's just one problem with most of them. They always seem to blame shift. And blame shifting never seems to solve the problem. You ever notice that? We see it all the time. We see it with leadership and government, right? Oh, well, you know, not my issue. I inherited this, or you inherited that, right? It's so easy. It's so easy to pass the block, but the truth is, blame shifting seldom hope. Let's, let's be honest. Standing for Christ in this new era that we find ourselves in is not going to be easy. As the culture changes more rapidly than ever before, standing for Jesus is not for the faint of heart. Have you noticed that? Trying to live a life of focus, to take more ground for the kingdom, to advance the, the, the cause of Jesus is not easy. It takes laser-like intentionality. Here's the truth. If you're not currently involved in the hardest thing you have ever done in your life, you're probably not growing. Did you know that? If you are currently not involved in the hardest thing you've done in your life, you're probably not being stretched. You're probably not growing. You're probably not taking ground. It's only at the edge of our abilities that we begin to expand our capacity, right? That's how we grow. We have to get out of our comfort zone. This is how we take new ground. We have to be willing to step out of our comfort zone. David, I think we got an image here that I want to put up. If it, uh, oh, did the computer die? Oh, man, our computer died. There is an image here that shows a sweet spot, and it's got this beautiful thing. There it is. In our comfort zone, we have the risk zone, and then we have the panic zone. But look where all the growth and the transformation happens. Where do we like to stay? In the white, in the comfort zone. Oh, man, we love our comfort, don't we? Heated leather seats. Oh, I heard, I heard the best. One of our church members was overheard complaining about the COVID-friendly chairs that are wiped down, I believe, even though they're lightly padded. And the other person responded, what do you care? You're only here once every seven weeks. You know, oh, even when you come, you only sit down for half the service. I mean, can we, seriously, I would love that. I was like, what do you care? You show up once every six weeks. I love it. Are you willing to be uncomfortable for Christ? Are you willing to be uncomfortable to invite? When is the last time you brought somebody with you to hear the good news? It's all about keeping the main thing the main thing. Taylor Welch had a huge quote. He said, comfort is the currency you pay in exchange for growth. Wow. Man, that just gets you right in the core. This means taking a cold, hard look in the mirror, taking ownership of the things in our life that aren't what we want them to be. The great news is you're the coach. You're the coach of your team. You get to make the call. You get to decide. Uh, Chris Abbott had a great thing. He said, it's time to declare war. If you're unhappy with your health, declare war on it. Go on the offense. If you're unhappy with your relationships, go on the offense. 
If you're unhappy with your marriage, if you're unhappy with your love life, all the things, you can change it, but we have to take responsibility, be willing to step out in faith and embrace what the Lord gives in his direction, in his word. Quit playing defense and go on the offense because tomorrow is too expensive to wait for. Time is short. We have to go back on offense. And usually we focus on these at New Year's, but today I want us to look at something. I'm going to share 10 questions that came from a, uh, a team of writers. They had 50 and they whittled it down to 10. And they, they said this, and they used the scripture coming out of 2 Corinthians 13 that says, be careful to examine yourselves. See whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, all right? So as we get started, just sit back. You don't have to answer these out loud, but I want you to answer these quick 10 questions in your mind. It's a spiritual checkup. Are you ready? This is your halftime checkup. Number one, do you have a growing awareness of God's presence in your life? Do you have a growing awareness of his presence in your life? Number two, are you increasingly aware of any sin in your life? Ooh. Right? God's word is a spotlight. The more time you spend in it, the more time it shows up and illuminates those dark areas. How can we be more like Jesus? Are you increasingly aware of any sin in your life? Number three, is God's word challenging you to change then? Is God's word challenging? Is there something in God's word that you're wrestling with to become more like Jesus? Something maybe you're struggling to implement? If so, that's good. You want that. You're supposed to give it permission to do that. Question four, are you pursuing God's plan for your life or your plan? Great question. Are you pursuing God's plan for your life or your plan, how you fit in to reach the world for him? Number five, are you growing in love for those who have been difficult for you to love? Ooh. Yeah, how about that? Are you growing in love for those who are as cuddly as a cactus to you, who have the personality of a sunburn, those people that are tough to love? I'm supposed to grow in love for them, be encouraging them, praying for them. Number six, ooh, this is a doozy. Be honest, is there any discipline to your spiritual growth? Or is it haphazard? We have, we have a lot of discipline about some things. Discipline about my handicap. I'm terrible at golf, by the way. I played once in 1994. It was terrible. Number seven, how actively are you involved and invested in God's local church? How consistently, how faithfully are you gathering with his church every Sabbath? Great question. Hard to serve God in absentia. Number eight, this is probably my favorite one of all 10. Is your lifestyle noticeably different than your friends who don't know Jesus? I like that. It should. In a culture that, that disparages Christ, we should stand out. We're not called to blend in, right? Jesus didn't blend in. We're supposed to be Christ followers, imitators of Christ. That's what Christian means, little Christ. Number nine, is your relationship with God a source of great delight? And if so, does it show on your face? <laughs> I heard one pastor say, uh, some of us, man, we look like we just got baptized in prune juice mixed with vinegar, and someone shot our dog. Go, what is that? If you're saved, how about we notify our face? We need to, it's okay. And number 10, do you live with increasing gratitude because of all that God has done for you? What a great question. These are good things to get us thinking because we're going to talk about the main thing today. And it won't take long. Paul, Paul gets straight to the point. Go ahead and open to Philippians chapter 3 and kind of hold your place there because context here of what he's dealing with is unbelievable. Paul is giving the ultimate halftime speech. He's like Coach Belichick or, or it was it Arians, the new coach with the Buccaneers and stuff. And as he, as he looks at this, kind of the context, he's warning people. He's saying, my brothers, my sisters, you need to be on the watch for the dogs. Watch out for the evil workers. Watch out for those who put confidence in themselves and their flesh. And Paul goes on to say something I love. He goes on to say, listen, y'all feel proud? You bragging about your legacy, your rich? Check out my resume. And Paul whips out his resume right there in front of everybody. And he hates doing it because he's actually a very humble guy. He says, you think you're proud? 
I was circumcised on the eighth day. He's got his resume out. He says, I'm from the nation of Israel. What about you? I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Hebrew, born of Hebrews, two Hebrews. I'm big. He goes on, he rattles this huge thing off. He says, oh, you want to talk about the law? I'm a Pharisee. What about you? I'm a Pharisee. I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees. Regarding zeal, check, I persecute the church. What you been doing? He is on a roll. This is not like Paul. He's listing his whole resume. Then he goes on to say, oh, you want to talk about righteousness? Regarding the law, everything that's in it? I am blameless. Like, wow, Paul, I can't believe you're doing that. And then he does something unbelievable. He tears it up. Right there in front of him. He rips it up. And he says, you know what I consider this? Rubbish. Boom. He said, in fact, he uses the word excrement. I consider it dung. My righteousness, my resume, all that I am, it is all about Christ. I am going to keep him the main thing. Everything I did, everything I worked for, everything that everybody thought I should be doing, it matters nothing. I want to focus on him. Everything that I consider to gain, I now consider loss. He uses the Greek word zemane here. By the way, that means absolute zero, total loss. I consider it not even on the books. That's what he thought about everything he lived for because he knew his righteousness was only based on faith in Christ. And then he zeroes in on the most important thing to him. Verse 10, he says, my goal now is to know him. And we're like, yes, go, Paul. Now you're on the right track. I want to know the power of his resurrection. You're like, yes, double yes, let's go. Keep going, Paul. I want to know the fellowship. We're like, yeah, and he goes, I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. <laughs> and we're like, wait, what? I was with you till." I think Paul messed up. Let's, let's keep reading. He says, uh, I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. Well, nope, okay, he's not messing up. He, he means it. Paul's off his medicine because that is weird. And in verse 12, he says, I want to know something, guys. I haven't reached the goal. I'm not perfect, but I am making every effort to take hold of it because I have been taken hold of by Jesus. You see this? Do you emulate this? This is a man who is 100% sold out to Jesus. He is fired up for him. He is keeping the main thing, the main thing. And that's the context of the scripture we study. Look at verse 13. He says, brothers, sisters, I don't consider myself to have taken hold of this. But one thing I do, forgetting what's behind, reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Therefore, check this out, let all of us who are mature... Think this way. And I love this next line. It's almost like a, like a backhanded little, 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 little spank. He says, and if you think differently about that, that's okay. God will fix it. <laughs> God will reveal it to you what's right. Y'all, this is Paul's halftime pep talk for us. For 2021, sitting here in July, he is talking about where is your focus? What is your perspective? This is the key to success in living for Jesus. Paul says, the heart of his message, he says, this one thing I do. Anybody old enough to remember the movie City Slickers? Anybody remember that? Y'all remember the, the Jack Palance character when Billy Crystal's riding the horse? He's like, God, I, just, I knew what it is. He goes, oh, you need to know the one thing. Yes, what's that, right? And he never tells him. <laughs> it's like, oh, you got to figure that out on your own. That's what I think of when Paul's here. It's like this one thing, keep the main thing the main thing. There's so many distractions out there. You want your second half of 2021 to be better, to bear more fruit? Start by keeping the main thing the main thing, your walk with Christ. The great O.S. Hawkins had a huge quote that, that went viral among the, the church world. He said this, the key element to your spiritual growth is not only your ability to obtain focus, but it's to maintain it in your Christian life. He said that in, in the, the Joshua Code. What a profound quote. So today we look at, at Paul. He says you need to have a laser-like focus. And he gives four things we're supposed to do. The first one's this. Proper perspective puts our priorities in their proper order. This is beautiful. How many of our priorities are out of whack? We prioritize so many things ahead of our spiritual growth. And then we wonder why we feel disconnected from God. We prioritize so many other things on the weekends. Don't show up. And then we wonder why we're out of the loop. It's incredible. We don't read time in his word. And we're like, what is it? You can't say God is silent if your Bible stays closed. This is how he speaks. This is one of the key ways. This is what he's talking about. Focus, how to maintain that, a proper perspective. He says, one thing I do, not 10, not five, not even two things. Look at that. Look how he's putting it in proper order. 
You have to define your goal and then allow that goal to define you. Paul says, look, I haven't got this nailed down, but I know this. I haven't arrived, but I'm pressing towards my goal. I, the Greek he uses literally means to lay hold of, as if to tackle somebody or pull someone down. Dave, you got that picture of that guy tackling in that, just pick a random team here, um, where, oh, wait, that's Ohio State not tackling the Alabama guy. That's an example of not using the Greek word. Here's the actual picture. Okay, so what we have here, Ohio State's getting gang tackled. These guys are literally doing what Paul say. I literally grab it, I know my tackle, I know my goal, and I am pulling it down. I literally have you in my sights, and I will not rest until I have taken down my goal. Now, be honest. How many of us are that tenacious about our faith following Christ? I literally will not rest. I have you in my sights. I will do this one thing. Jesus, you are my highest priority. I will teach it to my kids. I will make sure they are hearing God's word. See, the next thing leads this. He says, proper perspective helps us look forward. And too many of us are wasting time looking around, checking out everything else. Or worse yet, we're looking behind, looking at our past. Some of us have an albatross tied to our neck, and it's rotting and decaying, and we can't get past our past. And God says, you have to look forward, press forward. He says, forgetting what is behind. Paul almost has this bizarre, wise forgetfulness. You know, it sounds like an oxymoron. But he says, I choose to forget the past. I want, y'all ever watch a scary movie? I'm not endorsing any of these things that I watched in the 80s, full confession. Sorry about that. I sinned. And I watched some of these movies where there's a dude in a hockey mask with a machete, right? And he's chasing this, the, the final girl. She's like, oh, no, no. And every time she trips, looking back and falls, right? It's like, oh, I can't go anywhere. I'm like, why did you look back? You know the dude with the hockey mask is not your friend. The machete's not like a, you know, a casserole welcoming you to the neighborhood. He's not your friend. Why did you even turn around? Why look back, right? And you scream at the, at the movie screen and throw your popcorn, quit doing stupid things. I don't want to be that person. You know who I want to be? I want to be the guy who's in the movie, walking away in slow motion with a giant explosion behind him. He's throwing the grenade, right? And he's just walking forward, and he is living life. McGruber! He doesn't even look back. You know what? It's called the hero walk or the explosion walk. This is such a thing. It is literally a cliche in Hollywood. Look how many movies use this. I want you to think about this in your life. Are you so busy checking out your past, dealing with baggage, sin, toxic relationships that you are tripping over it and the bad guy's about to get you? Or are you looking forward in confidence, following Christ, saying, I am not anchored. My past does not define me. And aren't you glad yours doesn't? If you know Christ, we move forward. It's so tempting to look back and linger over it or marinate in it or stew in it or gossip about it. Don't do it. It's ungodly and unhelpful for you. Move forward. Satan would love nothing more than for you to get caught up in your past. You hear me say that? The enemy loves to remind you of your past. Just remind him of his future. Rebuke him. You do not live in your past. Peter had to move past this when he denied Christ. God ended up calling him the rock of the church. Joseph was betrayed, lost his family. I mean, they would call him and said he raped people and did all kinds of stuff. Ended up forgiving him and going to serve God with passion and purpose. Look at the examples. Regardless of your past, doesn't matter what's held back there. Turn your eyes toward Jesus. Trust his redemptive power. Y'all, it is only half time. It's only July. When we jettison the past and we surrender it to the cross, this proper perspective allows us, we begin to see our glass now half full instead of half empty. It gives us this forward look. See, Paul says, I'm reaching forward. Notice the active tense here. I'm reaching forward. The idea here is he's straining as if reaching for a baton that the wrestler or the, the runner is handing off to the next leg of the race. You see that? He says, I'm not going to rest. It's always just without my grasp. And he he could have coasted. He could have sat back on his laurels. You heard his resume. It's real easy to give up. It's real easy to coast. Reaching forward is our admonition. Church, are you doing that? Do you have the spiritual discipline? How seriously are we taking this? The good news is, if you want to improve, it's only half time. You can change it. Reaching forward, that leads us to his next point. Having that proper perspective will take us the second mile. I love this. Having that focus, that passion, 
it gives us this desire to do not only what's required, but do additional, to do then some. Not only what's required, but then some. Paul says, I press. You know what that word means in the original language? It means an intense endeavor, as if you are a starving hunter, and you have you spotted a gazelle, and you are about to take it down. Like, you are focused on it. You are silently stalking it with intense gaze and passion. How many times do we spend that with the Lord? When anything and everything comes between gathering, studying, inviting people to know Jesus, talking to our neighbors... We wonder why only 19% of our country is gathering today. 19%. Y'all, that's happened on our watch. It wasn't that way on our grandparents' watch. We can't blame the greatest generation. Can't blame boomers. Goodness, everybody blames boomers for everything, don't they? Goodness. This happened on our watch. How intense are we living for Christ? He says, I have one thing, and his priority was so obvious. Do you know what it was? Paul's priority was living for Christ telling others about him. So, you know, I got to ask, <laughs> how about you? When's the last time? Time's short. The Lord comes back tomorrow. I do not want to be standing before him empty-handed, not having done my, my duty living for Christ. I'm going to put up a picture of a person. If you recognize who this is, we're going to continue the football theme. Shout out his name. Here we go. If it, well, who knew that? Gronk. Gronkowski. What's his first name? Ron. Rob. Ron. Ron. Ron Gronkowski. Everybody knows who it is. Gronk. Okay? Gronk won a Super Bowl, probably more than that, with Brady at the Patriots. And he retired. But then Tom Brady went to the Buccaneers, called up his buddy who was retiring, enjoying life on the beach, resting up, said, hey, buddy, you need to come. We're going to win another Super Bowl together. Said, no, I'm not. I'm fine. My feet are propped up. I got my dog here. Got my little Diet Coke. He says, come on. Come out of retirement. Be my wingman. Let's do this one more time. Let's show people in their 40s still got it. So he did. He came out of retirement. But the Buccaneers did something very interesting. They had looked at Gronk, and they said, he doesn't quite look football shape. In fact, he had actually lost weight, stopped working out, lost his muscle tone, had dropped multiple pounds. And it, why not? He was enjoying his retirement. So they sent him a legal request saying, we need proof, video proof of your workouts that you will be field ready come game time. So Gronk did, sort of. Guess what he did? He went to the stadium. He had a buddy filming him. Got on his outfit, and he started running wind sprints up and down the stadium. That sweat. Showed him in the gym, lifting weights, working out crazy. Then they'd show him sprinting with the parachute on his back, and he's huffing and puffing, and they're seeing his arms swell up, he's getting that buff, and he's ready to go. Then he would change his shirt and do it all again for about 10 minutes. Then he would change his outfit and do it again, running up the same flight of stairs. He did this countless times on one day. You know what he did next? He didn't do a single thing the rest of a training camp. Every single morning, he would email a new video of him filmed weeks ago on that one day wearing a different outfit, and his trick worked. The head coach, Bruce Arians, was literally quoted, overheard on a Zoom video conference call, I think with ESPN. He says, you know, they're asking, like, is Gronk going to be ready? He says, man, I can't believe, have you seen this guy's work ethic? Gronk's work ethic, he's working out like a demon. He is unbelievable. <laughs> No, that's not integrity. That's cutting corners. And that is not what Paul is talking about when he's encouraging us to press on when it's hard. When you have a thousand other things you could be distracted by. That's not what Paul's talking about when we're supposed to press on and go the second mile. You want your second half to be better than your first half? What is your one thing? What is your highest priority? Does your family know? Ask your kids. They'll tell you what your highest priority is. It leads us to Paul's last point. See, the proper perspective gives you the direction you need to function. Proper perspective gives us directions. It lets us know where we're going. 
Probably the most valuable asset we have is focus. It brings us ability to know where we're headed. I'm not going to be distracted to the left or the right. I've heard from God. This is what we're doing. This is the path. Here it is. Walk ye in it. The Greek word he uses here is skopos. Can you think of the English word that we get from that? Scope. Absolutely. Like a hunter's rifle. Like crosshairs. You see these crosshairs, and I love this comic because this is just such a perfect illustration. (laughs) Shoot him. He's using this word, literally means I have you in the crosshairs. Like, I know my bullseye, I know my target. I saw this other comic, it was just perfect for this. I love this one deer looking at a bummer of a birthmark, Hal. Goodness, I mean, you got a bullseye on your heart. What a bummer. Paul is literally using a Greek word that says, Do you know your bullseye? Are you focused? Do you have it in the crosshairs? Like a, like a scope on a rifle. Knowing our mission, this keeps our priorities in the bullseye of the target. So let me ask, what is it in your life that's distracting you and causing you to miss the mark? What temptation, what sin, maybe it's not even a sin, what lesser activity is coming between you and your mission, advancing the gospel. Nine out of ten of us in this room know exactly what it is. In fact, if you're like me, it raced through your mind just now. You have a picture of it. You know. You know what it is. What are you going to do about it? See, having that proper perspective, it gives you the focus. It's a springboard to successful living. You want to be more like Christ? Be with people who worship Christ. You want to know more what God's will is? Spend time in his love letter that he wrote for you. It's not elusive. God's not some cryptic guy hiding behind the clouds saying, I know the perfect will for your life, but I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> you know? Like, what kind of a loving father is that? He wants you to know his will more than you want to know your will. Do you believe that? Do you know that? Keep focus by focusing on Christ, keeping him the center of your life, the center of your marriage, the center of your friendships. I want to do something different here. In fact, we'll uh, we'll land the plane differently. Amy, do you mind underscoring on this? Raise your hand if you like coffee. Okay, all right. Good, put them down. Raise your hand if coffee is the first thing you reach for in the morning. Like, it is your nectar of the gods. Okay, all right, then you know what I'm talking about. Like, your day can't start until... You have, it's like a heavenly cup. It just goes down and it reaches into the core of your being, right? Some of you know exactly what this feels like. It is just like this beautiful thing. It touches the very soul of your, of your life. Scripture has something similar to this along those lines, only it's not a pleasant feeling. There's a verse, a phrase called iron entering one's soul. And unlike the coffee meme, it's not pleasant. It's used to describe how extreme anguish or tough circumstances can either break you or create a fierce determination, a divine focus. Just like what Joseph had after he was so badly mistreated, sold into slavery, his brothers turned on him, wrongfully accused of rape, sent to prison, shackled in chains, shackled in irons. And in the Bible, one translation says, the iron then entered into his soul. I read that verse. I'm thinking, what what exactly does that mean? And then I got an email from Pastor Greg Laurie over at Harvest, over in California. Great, great, awesome, awesome pastor. His son was tragically killed, young in life. And he wrote this. He says, in the aftermath, the, the wreckage here of my son Christopher dying, I felt like iron had entered into my soul. By that... I mean I felt a new strong resolve to do things for God and his kingdom that I had never done before. And I wasn't going to let people's opinions or fear of what anyone thinks, fear of man, I wasn't even going to let failure stop me. He writes this, Christopher's passing gave me a stronger view of eternity, knowing he was in glory. I wanted to make every day count. And that determination is still with me today. I don't want to squander my time. I want to leverage my opportunities for God's glory to reach as many people as I can while I can. And he closed with this sentence. So I'm not going to waste this pain. 
I'm going to use this pain as a tool. In fact, I'm going to use it as a weapon against the devil. I'm going to bring as many people hope in Jesus as I can as I point them to the cross. There it is. The one thing. The one thing. Keeping the main thing the main thing. It's not the stuff that distracts us. It's not our pet project. It's not our pet ministry. It's the main event. It's the main event. Are we even telling people what awaits them without Jesus? It's real. Time is short. Look around. When the world is on flames and on fire, they're looking for the fire extinguisher. You have it. Are you distracted, though, by so many other silly things? Notice what Paul said. I didn't hit this on earlier on purpose. He said, those who are mature should know this. If you consider yourself mature, maybe you're a seasoned citizen, we know better. We know this. We're supposed to live this. They're looking. To, we are the ambassadors. We can't say, well, the cavalry's coming. We are the cavalry. <laughs> this is it. The one thing, the mission of the church, and I'm so thankful to be a part of a local church who understands the need for missions overseas, the need for missions here in North Carolina. You know, we get to sponsor these missionaries and send them to Ghana in two weeks. Maybe you couldn't go, but you could sponsor them. Local missions. We get to sponsor a church needed our help. Couldn't do it without us. Maybe you couldn't go. But by golly, can we support those who can? Let's do it. We sponsor a child through Compassion International. I can't physically go and feed them, but by golly, God's given me enough money that I can support somebody who's willing to go. I'm so grateful. So thankful that you guys understand the vision. May we have a strong resolve, just like Greg Laurie was saying, to say, iron has entered my soul. I will not be distracted left or right. I am moving forward with a determination and a boldness. This is the path. Walk ye in it. So I want to encourage you. Do a self-inventory this week. Ask your neighbors. Ask your, ask your pastor. Looking at my life, what would you say is my highest priority? Your kids will tell you. Your spouse will tell you. I'll tell you. Iron entered his soul, and it changed him. Now here's the point that I would typically open up the altar. And we'd stand and we'd sing a song. But I want to do something different. I want to honor somebody who frequently gets overlooked. Probably one of the hardest things. We're going to sing a song. I think if, uh, Brenda, we got that. We're going to sing a different song. Amy, I know you're playing keyboard, but I need you to come stand over here with me. This is Amy's birthday today. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you, sorry. Happy birthday, dear Amy. Happy birthday to you. Yes. 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 We, we honor this woman. Y'all are good at honoring the pastor, but it's so easy to forget what makes a pastor successful. It's so easy to overlook a pastor's wife. And today, Amy, we say as a church collectively, we value you. We know what you do. The unseen tears you cry, the midnight counseling sessions, when longtime friends walk away, when you stay late at night scrubbing spots off of a stain that showed up Saturday night, the unseen things, staying up late rehearsing notes on your keyboard just so you can bring your best to the Lord. I can't look at you because I'll lose it. I want you to know God sees that. Your family sees that, and we celebrate you. We love you. We honor you. We are so grateful. This, this church, uh, we stand in awe of your humility, your gentleness, your graciousness, your patience, and we love you, and we are going to devour a cake in your honor. <laughs> so, yeah, sure. Thank you. She's been with me over a quarter century, and she has walked with me now 30 years in the ministry, and that is a long time to put up with a pastor and uh, the unseen burden you bear. So we love you. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to be meeting with our Ghana missionaries right after this, but we're going to stand, and I'm going to have a, a prayer, and I'll be with Pastor Bill and the team. I believe we're meeting over here on the left side. Is that right? Okay, brother. Um, we'll stand. 
Brenda and Marin are going to cut this cake. We're not blowing out any candles or nothing like that. Come by, get a cake, give her a hug, tell her you love her, and let her know. Okay, would you stand with me together? I'll close this out with prayer, and then we'll uh, continue to celebrate and have our, our missionary meeting. Lord, you are so good. I thank you for the privilege of pastoring this church, and I thank you for the privilege of being the husband of this amazing woman. We celebrate her. Thank you for another year of life. Thank you for all she is, all she does, for her love. Thank you for her, the inspiration that she is, for her genuineness, for her humility, for her grace and her poise and her character and her integrity. She is a great reflection of you, and Lord, we celebrate that today. Thank you for your word today. Thank you that you remind us to keep the main thing, the main thing. Lord, set a guard over our mouth, clamp over our lips if we dare complain when there are people who need to hear the gospel. May we not be distracted, God. Help us stay focused on you. May we glorify you. Send us out with joy, boldness, and passion that Paul had. This is our prayer as we go in Jesus' name. And all God's church said, amen. amen.